Rabbit Hole follows the story of a brilliant corporate spy by the name of John Weir, whose life has been turned upside down over the course of the last three weeks. In a flash-forward scene, John visits a church even though he's not religious. In fact, he's not looking for counsel or salvation. He just needs someone, anyone, to listen to him. We then go back three weeks in time to find out what he's on about. Firstly, he targets someone by the name of Barry Merrill at a bar. Barry owns a good amount of stock in a drug company called Esper Ethica. John and his team hack the TV and broadcast some fake news to make it seem like there's a major problem with one of Esper Ethica's new drugs. And that, combined with other tactics John employs, convinces Barry to sell his stocks immediately before the price crashes. The price wasn't gonna crash as Barry was the only one who saw the news and this con was beneficial to one of John's clients who swooped in and bought the stocks on the cheap. After the job's done, John meets a woman at the bar, Haley Winton, and he spends the night with her even though he suspects this might be a blackmail scheme. His suspicions are somewhat confirmed in the morning when he finds a camera in their hotel room but he doesn't care. He warns Haley and whoever her masters are to never mess with them again. Haley freaks out and insists that she has no idea what John's talking about. That morning we get the lowdown on the Barry Merrill ordeal from FBI agent Joe Maddie, who has been on John's tail for a good while now. She thinks she can nail him on corporate espionage. John knows she can't prove anything, so he gets to his office after telling Joe that she's gonna have to do better than the camera at the hotel and the tail outside the hotel. Joe claims she wasn't behind either of those things. Following a team meeting, John visits his son's school and watches Sam's talent show performance. We learn that John is divorced as he catches up with his ex-wife Liv. Later that night, he reminisces about his father Ben before messaging someone on a games message board asking if they're there. John and whoever's on the other side use this game so that their comms can't be tracked easily. For now, we don't know who's on the other side. The next day, John has a meeting with Miles Valance, his old partner in crime who's now the CEO of a big company called Arda Analytics. The meeting is about two companies, Lux Brandt and the Bonomar Group. Arda Analytics has been hired by Lux Brandt to make it seem like the investigation into them regarding the usage of child labor was manufactured by their rival, Bonomar. That is not true, but John's job is to make it look true. So John and his team, consisting of Kara, Manfred, Hafiz and Kyle the intern, get to work. They have to snap a few photos of Dana Heinrich and Edward Hom together. Dana is the CEO of Banomar and Edward is the Treasury Department investigator in charge of the Lux Brandt investigation. Through a complicated plan which involves Hafiz taking Dana to the wrong part of town as a taxi driver and Manfred posing as a policeman and sending Edward's driver away from the hotel, they manage to get Dana and Edward side by side in front of Edward's hotel. That is when Kara comes into the picture with a bunch of dogs because they know that this will freak Dana out. Manfred uses that distraction to drop an envelope on the ground with Banomar's logo on it and thinking that Dana dropped the envelope, Edward gives it to her and voila, there's the photo, job done. John can't stop thinking about who sent Haley after him, so he confronts her and wants to know the truth and it turns out Haley saw John on a dating app. But the funny thing is, John doesn't even have an account. As they are both baffled, the big screen on the street starts showing the news announcing that Edward has been murdered and John is the main suspect. Upon seeing that, Haley uses her martial arts training to deal a few blows and she runs away. John is hurt but he manages to get back to the office to figure out why Valence turned on them. However, as John approaches the building, an explosion wipes out his team. Distraught, John makes his way to Arda Analytics, sneaking into Valence's office and the situation gets even more peculiar. Valence claims it wasn't him that turned on John. He then looks at his laptop and sees a message saying, do it now. Throughout this interaction, Valence keeps looking at the camera inside his office, clearly aware that they are being watched. Valence steps out to his balcony to answer a call and he jumps, making John's day even more miserable than it already is. 
John escapes the building and uses his childhood home as a safe haven, but that's not all. We have one last twist in the premiere, and that's the fact that Edward is being kept there by John. So Edward wasn't killed like the news claimed, but John went further than we initially thought by kidnapping Edward. John goes back to Haley at the start of episode 2, and it's good that he does because two goons posing as police officers attempt to lure in Haley. John sees her being taken to the same car that was following him in episode 1, so he intentionally makes a scene by filming the so called officers, which allows him and Haley to escape. They go back to John's childhood home with Haley blindfolded in the trunk to make sure she can't tell where they are. Their funny back and forth culminates with their realization that John's employees must have opened a dating account for him because he is lonely and all of this is a big coincidence. In the meantime, Edward tries to escape and he's stopped. Haley feels safe knowing that John didn't kill Edward and he agrees to take her back because he doesn't think she's involved. That said, Haley wants to stay with him as she'll continue to be targeted by whoever's after John. She feels like she's gonna be safer with him. We then visit the site of the explosion and learn that Kyle the intern is the sole survivor. Joe wants to look around the crime scene but the special agent in charge, Rash, doesn't like that idea because Joe is from financial crimes and this investigation is out of her league. Joe still sneaks around and manages to briefly talk to Kyle before Rash kicks her out. She thinks it's weird how Kyle got away with only a few scratches while the other three bodies found on the scene were burnt to a crisp. So she urges Rash not to take anything at face value, but he continues to dismiss her. Elsewhere, John returns to his investigation by interrogating Valence's right-hand man Xander, asking him why Valence would turn on him even after he agreed to kill Edward behind his own employees' backs. We know John only kidnapped Edward, he didn't kill him, but Xander isn't aware of that, and he's clearly afraid of the mastermind of this whole plot, uh, but John gets him talking after a while. He says that the only way to access Valence's data is by using his authenticator, which is currently sitting in an evidence room. John needs Valence's data to understand why he would turn on him, and why he would off himself. This kicks off an outrageously fascinating sequence in which John walks into the police station pretending to be a cop. After all, the con in con man stands for confidence, and that's John's angle here. Surprisingly, this approach works. He gets the evidence out even though he's a wanted man. This is when Kyle joins in on the fun as he helps John escape by locking the station's doors. Joe was following Kyle, but she gets stuck inside too, while John and Kyle just walk away. But Kyle turns on John at the last second, grabbing the authenticator and attempting to run away following a ferocious brawl scene. Luckily for John, Haley comes to his rescue, hitting Kyle with their car as Joe watches on with absolute bewilderment. They get back to the hideout where they're greeted by John's father, Ben. This is an unsettling development because flashbacks throughout the episode revealed that Ben offed himself following the collapse of his marriage. And these flashbacks also revealed that Ben was a government agent, so I guess the thought of his faking his death isn't that shocking. But nonetheless, as a kid, John thought his father really died, and this scarred him. Little Johnny and his mom were driving away because of the divorce and John escaped and went back to the house which is when Ben killed himself or I guess faked his death. That must have been one heck of a tragic experience for John. But I guess all's well that ends well. Ben seems to be okay and he's helping his son interrogate Edward. Episode 3 is the most meaty installment of the season so far as flashbacks reveal a substantial amount of backstory, starting with a few scenes from 1986. We follow how Ben's fake death unfolded. After this horrible experience, John keeps going back to their house to understand the motive behind his father's actions and John's main goal is to break into the safe. He can't figure out the combination, so he tries blowing it up instead. A mistake that leads to his mother sending him to boarding school. But this is a blessing in disguise because there he meets Valence. Valence is great at math and John convinces him to run away together to break into the safe. 
Valence eventually figures out that the combination is a code for John's name, making John teary-eyed as he finally has confirmation that his father valued him. This doesn't fix everything, obviously. He is still emotionally unstable throughout his life because of this event, but learning about the combination at least makes him feel a little bit better. Valence and John use the documents they find in the safe to launch their careers, as the contents of the files are extremely powerful. Ben calls them the algorithms of control. He was a psychologist helping the CIA study and manipulate human behavior, whether it be in small groups or large ones, like the population of an entire country, for example. So these files are extremely useful when Valence and John launch DBA advisors. A flashback from 2013 reveals how our devious duo worked with that information. They help a snack company retain their market share by infiltrating the focus group of another snack manufacturer that was about to come up with a similar product. DBA advisors identify this problem and solve it. Later on, Valence discusses the importance of big data with John. They both agree to launch what will eventually become Arta Analytics. So at first, they were in on this venture together, which raises the question of how they broke up. We have to jump forward four years in order to begin to answer that question. That is when Ben returns from the dead, very much to John's dismay, as you can imagine. Ben keeps going on about a grand conspiracy involving the recent disappearance of an Aero Delhi flight. He claims that there was a guy on that plane bringing him proof about our apparent main villain this season, Crowley. And we find out that Crowley was the reason Ben faked his death. He wanted to make sure that his family would be safe from Crowley. Ben and Crowley worked together at the CIA, employing the algorithms of control we previously mentioned, but Crowley went his own way at some point, going private and selling this information to the highest bidder, as well as using it for his own benefit. John has a hard time believing all of this, including Ben's assertion that his wife, John's mother, knew about the fake suicide. John isn't convinced until 2018, when one of Ben's claims materializes. Russia takes out the Suez and Panama canals to make sure they would have the only viable trade route to sell oil to Europe and North America. This leads to a meeting between John and Ben. Valence is also there because it's clear from these flashbacks that he is John's best friend and he's always been there for him. We could even say that if it wasn't for Valence, John's life would be an enormous mess. During this meeting, Ben says that Crowley's plan to sneakily influence and take over control of the United States institutions is already in motion. All he needs is a puppet president to win the next election. That is where John and Valence can come into play. Valence's Arta Analytics will split off into its own thing, and they'll do some shady stuff to attract Crowley's attention. Crowley's gonna think Arta could be useful for him. John, in the meantime, will work away from the spotlight with Ben. So Arta Analytics is bait, and John and Ben will try to capture that big fish in the form of Crowley once he takes the bait. Back to the present, John is now at a new safe house, where Ben keeps talking about Haley as if she isn't there, leading to a few moments of comic relief. Like Ben saying they should have killed her just to be safe. Haley is, let's say, stupefied by Ben and John's relationship, especially when she learns about the fact that Ben faked his death. Afterwards, John tries to download Valence's comms data by breaking into his account. He's got Valence's authenticator from episode 2, but he still needs to find the password. The hint says safety in numbers, which is a phrase Valence frequently used. John eventually remembers that time they cracked into the safe using an alphanumerical code, with each number in the combination being replaced with the letter of the alphabet corresponding to their position. For example, J is the 10th letter of the alphabet, O is the 15th, so the combination of the safe went like this, 10, 15, 8, 14, J-O-H-N, John. Now John applies the same technique to the word safety, and he gets these numbers, 19165-2025, which turns out to be Valence's password. Meanwhile, Xander, who is in charge of Arda for the moment, and his team attempt to track down John, and they get extremely close. 
However, earlier in the day, John sent an email to Joe pretending to be Xander. So Joe shows up at Arda for a meeting with Xander and he has to leave the room. He instructs his team not to do anything until he gets back. And by the time he realizes what's going on and gets back to the room, it is too late. John's got the data he needs and they've left the safe house. During this ordeal, Xander called his boss, presumably Crowley, to let him know they can get John's location and send a team after him. He failed, and the man behind the curtain has a phone call with Xander, after which Xander mysteriously falls to his death, just like Valence. What is going on here? Xander splats into the floor just behind Joe while she's on a call with Rash trying to explain to him how there's something bigger going on here, and the body behind her strengthens her case. Let's rewind a little bit to discuss a few more tidbits from the safe house. Ben attempts to convince Edward to cooperate because he figures that one of Edward's investigations led him to Crowley, which is why Crowley wanted Valance to hire John to kill Edward. Not confusing at all. But for now, Edward doesn't want to cooperate. Ben notices Haley in the garden, so he goes outside to check on her. Moments prior, Haley used her charm against John, chatting with him about their lives and forming a connection. John dropped his guard for a second, allowing Haley to pick up one of the phones on the desk behind him, and she said she was going out to the garden to pick some apples, but she was actually checking her crypto balance. That's when Ben almost catches her in the act. It looks like Ben is going to use all of his experience to catch Haley with the phone, but she simply drops it to the ground so her hands are empty when Ben checks them. This diminished my view of Ben quite considerably because Haley was very nervous and she was clearly hiding something, but Ben didn't even look around. He just looked at her empty hand and believed her, or even if he didn't believe her, he didn't do anything about it. In the end, Haley gets away with it and she's definitely not who she says she is. Even if she doesn't work for Crowley, she's got her own skeletons in the closet because her crypto account is worth more than $26 million. The fourth episode of the season reveals that Xander didn't jump out of the building on his own. It was Kyle who pushed him because he couldn't get a simple job done. Kyle's handler gives him a call afterward, scolding him for attracting this much attention, and Kyle doesn't like the fact that his help isn't appreciated. Then he and his girlfriend agree to go to a protest in Midtown where they're speaking up against something called the Shared Data Act. In the meantime, Joe spots Kyle while looking through the CCTV footage of Arda Analytics, and she eventually finds Kyle's secret hideout where there's an article about how to butcher an animal. Not suspicious at all. Also, Joe's office is contacted by an anonymous source about Edward's investigation into Arda, as well as someone named Elliot Gao. Joe is interested even though she suspects John might be behind this tip. She calls Gao, and I love the fact that Gao's phone shows that the FBI is calling. I just found that hilarious, but anyway. They agree to talk the next day because Gao is hosting an event that evening, and that's not a problem because that's exactly what John wanted. How did this come to be then? Well, in their new hideout, John looks into Valence's comms data, and Edward overhears Ben and John talking about Valence's out-of-character NFT purchases. This prompts Edward to finally start talking, revealing that Gao is a middleman helping Valence get paid under the radar by Crowley using NFTs. Edward was investigating Gao, which led him to Valence and Crowley, and that's why they wanted to kill Edward. The team agrees to scare Gao in the hopes that this would draw Crowley out. They plan to send Haley to Gao's party, where she'll pretend to be Joe, and this will scare Gao and Crowley even more. Haley gets some basic training from John before she goes in. She's taught to always listen to the person in her ear, while Edward is still in disbelief over her wife's reaction to his death. You see, he wanted to talk to her in order to cooperate with Ben and John, but they obviously couldn't let that happen. And the next best thing was to let him watch her using the security cameras inside their house. But Edward was in for a rude awakening. Because not only was her wife not sad, but she was also having an affair with their neighbor. As Haley goes into the party, John makes himself comfortable underground to hack into Gao's apartment's security system, while Edward chills in the van. 
Everything is going well, Haley is pretending to be Joe and Gao is getting spooked. But unfortunately, Haley's past catches up to her here. Her old boss from Chicago, Craig Payne, is at the party too. And that's a problem because Payne was a corrupt son of a bitch and Haley refused to cover up for him. Haley was Payne's real estate company's in-house counsel and she was pushed out. On her way out, she stole some crypto from the company's slush fund, which has since increased in value by quite a bit. It's now worth $26 million. At first, John tells Haley to abort the mission, but they have to abort the abort because the blue car from the first two episodes of the season is back. It turns out those guys weren't after John. No, they were following Haley. They were Payne's guys. And because of that, Haley has to stay up there. They don't want her to run into Payne's goons. John tells Edward to meet him outside and bring a clipboard. They go into Gao's building, pretending to be from the Department of Buildings so they can get access to the elevators. They successfully stole the bad guys and I think Edward actually kills a guy, but uh, we don't talk about that. Upstairs, Gao is contacted by Crowley, so his men apprehend Haley and wait for the big boss. He walks in and it's Ben. Ben is Crowley. Or at least that's what they want Gao to think. This way Ben gets Gao to reveal some info on Crowley because he thinks Ben is Crowley. Ben asks Gao what he told the real FBI agent on the phone and Gao says he might have inferred something like the fact that Crowley is not offshoring his money, he's simply concealing the source from the treasury department. He also says he didn't talk about Interverse or the Ledger and that is all they can get from Gao because the real Crowley messages him and asks him to take a photo of the person pretending to be him. Crowley immediately recognizes Ben so his cover is blown. Crowley no longer thinks that Ben is dead but Crowley can fix that. He tells Gao to kill Haley and Ben but luckily John gets back to his little nest underground and cuts off the power, allowing Haley to once again use her martial arts skills to neutralize Gao's goons and escape. As they run away, Edward gives them some information on Interverse. It's a media company which owns the website gettogether.com. That site allows users to have affairs and half of Washington is on the platform, giving Crowley plenty of ammo to control the political world. When somebody steps out of line, they are exposed. Like the congressman from a month ago whose affair came to light and he claimed that he was being blackmailed. This is when John says that he needs his team back because apparently they faked their deaths too. John and company continue their investigation in episode 5 with Edward looking into Interverse's political donations and John ringing every single number that might have called Valance before he jumped using Valance's comms data. Later on, Edward identifies Crowley's potential public president, a New Jersey senator named Nora Evers, who by the end of this episode announces her run for the presidency. Before they can process this information, the warehouse is attacked by two operatives and they almost get to the team but Ben's flank saves their asses. He kills one of the attackers and injures the other one as they make their escape. Edward is shot in the arm but he'll be okay. They find a place with cabins for rent and John keeps calling the numbers on Valence's logs. Weirdly enough, one of the phones starts ringing close to him and at this point he realizes his father was the one who called Valence. John assumes the worst, thinking that Ben prompted Valence to jump. But once again their location is discovered and they are under attack so they have to run into the woods. They find a place to rest for a little bit and Ben explains everything. On the day that John's team was supposed to fake their deaths, Ben went after Kyle. Kyle was sent outside with food orders because he wasn't a part of this fake death plan as both John and Ben knew that he was a plant. They disagreed on how to deal with Kyle though and Ben went behind John's back to kill Kyle. Kyle got the better of the old man and realized that his cover was blown. To cover his tracks, Kyle went back to the office before the trio there could set their fake death plan in motion. Kyle killed all of them and dumped them in the elevator shaft. Just a few minutes before the explosion, Ben came to the office to warn John's team about Kyle, but he was too late. Ben thought Kyle would die in the explosion. However, Kyle realized what was going on just seconds beforehand and retreated just enough to survive the explosion. 
So Ben's call to Valence was about this. He wanted to warn Valence, but Valence told him he didn't have a choice and jumped from the balcony. The hit squad discovers the team's location, and John finally figures out how they are being tracked. It's the whiskey bottle Haley took from Gao's party. The bottle is worth 100k, so it's obviously chipped. They leave the bottle behind and are able to escape. Their next move will be to get to Senator Evers. In the meantime, the FBI bureaucracy slows down Joe, but she refuses to be stopped. By pretending to be a fundraising soccer mom, Joe is able to get herself invited to John's ex-wife's house, where Liv is drinking a familiar sounding wine. Joe realizes that Liv must have gotten this bottle from Kara because her credit card records show that she had bought a wine fridge a couple of months ago. Joe figures that if Kara was buying wine a week before her death, her fridge must have been full of wine when she died in the explosion. But no, her fridge was empty, suggesting that Kara gave the wine away because she knew that she would have to fake her death. And so one of Kara's bottles is at Liv's house. That's how Joe connects the dots. With that in mind, Joe decides to pay another visit to DBA advisor's offices. There she decides to call Kara, and to her surprise, the phone rings. The sound is coming from the elevator shaft. Joe takes a look and finds the real bodies of John's employees. Up until that point, Rash was certain that the team died in the explosion. That's because they were very thorough, going as far as to pull their own teeth and place them on the fake bodies to fool the DNA tests. They were successful, they fooled Rash, and this case was closed in his book. But Joe proves that that is not the case. Senator Evers is the team's target in episode 6, as she's been busy promoting the highly controversial Shared Data Act, which would allow the government to share their citizens' government records and consumer data with select private companies, in the name of safety, of course. That's usually how people lose their freedoms. There's a crisis which bad faith actors exploit in order to advance their agendas. John and his team create a distraction to delay Evers' motorcade, and John's deception leads her to his car. They get straight to the chase. Valence's comms data has allowed the team to discover how Evers' campaign was being funded, and because the shady source of her money would get her into trouble, John gives her an ultimatum. She either works with them to bring down Crowley, or she's going down. Evers is unexpectedly calm, insisting that she will not cooperate because Crowley has some nasty compromising information on her, much worse than what John has. She explains how one day she was kidnapped and taken to a briefcase with compromising information in it, and ever since then she has worked for Crowley. From her description, Edward, who is the driver, surmises that she must be talking about 1550 Girard. He came across this location during his investigations. It is a state-of-the-art vault crooks use to store their valuables. In this case, Crowley stores information there. Evers agrees to work with John if he can retrieve the aforementioned briefcase, and she also wants her trusted man Lanneman to be part of the heist. In order to scout the location, John, alongside Lanneman, pretends to be a client, and he asks for a box in the 800 section because he says 8 is his lucky number. In reality, that's where Crowley's box is. So here's how 1550 Girard works. The client is escorted to their box, and they have to follow a certain path given to them, as the entire place is covered in infrared motion sensors that get activated the moment you step out of your prescribed route. John tests this out, and it works as intended. When you get to your box, you put in your key, and your escort puts in the master key. You turn them at the same time, so John needs a master key, but that's not an issue because he gets a good photo of the master key during his initial visit. He traces it to a blank and cuts the key, so he's got his own master key now. With that part settled, all they need is to make a $20 million deposit in escrow. No biggie. They'll get their money back when they stop using the vault, which is their plan, but they still need the initial money. And that's where Haley comes into play with her crypto fortune. She is a bit hesitant at first because John hasn't been himself after finding out the truth about his team and how his father hid that fact from him. But eventually she chooses to trust John and the plan is in motion. 
Lanneman and John go first with their briefcase, and once they're inside the 800 section, Haley arrives pretending to be a new client looking for a tour. She plays a crucial role because as she's shown around the place, she keeps triggering the alarm using an infrared pen. She does this multiple times and the escort is bamboozled because the ceiling sensors are getting triggered. He has no idea how. So he is forced to call in a hard reboot of the system which takes 60 seconds. Meanwhile, Lanneman pretends to be a claustrophobic veteran freaking out because they keep getting locked in. Their escort has to deal with Lanneman because he's causing a scene, allowing John to access Crowley's box as the system is getting rebooted and the alarms are off. All seems good until John realizes that he forgot to pick up the master key on Crowley's box. Haley and John run into each other and John tells her to abort because the key is gonna expose them. But Haley trusts in her abilities and continues her tour into the vault. She throws away her pen to trigger the alarm and distract the escort, allowing her to swoop in and remedy John's mistake. Outside, Lanneman crosses John and takes the briefcase. So Evers isn't a woman of her word. Who could have guessed? A politician betraying somebody. Wow. Anyway, John saw this coming too, which is why he hid Crowley's briefcase in his own depository box. So what Evers has is just the initial decoy case. This means Evers is going to have to work with John whether she likes it or not. They agree to meet at 3 p.m., but her team adds another speech to her schedule, so she can't make it then. Meanwhile, John and Haley have been getting closer, culminating with a kiss in this episode after John thanks her for trusting him with the money. Elsewhere, Kyle's boss contacts him once again, this time telling him to activate his long-term mark. That mark is his girlfriend Eliza. He got together with her just to use her in an opportune moment such as this one. Her deteriorating mental health and fringe political affiliations made her the perfect target. Over the course of the last few episodes, we've learned that she's not a fan of the Shared Data Act, and she's been hanging out at political rallies where the rhetoric is to kill your masters. And because Kyle has positioned Eliza perfectly, he urges her to do just that. Since Evers is the face of the Shared Data Act, Eliza goes after her and kills her before her speech. Snipers are positioned to allow her to get away, so Lanneman is killed before he can apprehend Eliza. And Eliza is killed by Kyle because she's served her purpose and they can't let her talk. Kyle's demeanor as he gets rid of Eliza is chilling because so far he's really made us and her believe that he cared about her. It looked like Eliza was the only thing he cared about, but uh, that wasn't the case. Kyle is one cold son of a gun. The media and the political world use this assassination and Eliza's profile to advance their agenda. Evers is made a martyr and her bill, the Shared Data Act, is seen as absolutely necessary to prevent evil acts such as the one committed by Eliza. As John and his team come to the same conclusion, John is contacted on the message board he and Valence used to communicate. This is baffling because he thought Valence was really dead. The person contacting John, seemingly Valence, says they're sorry and they had to make it look real. This development isn't going to make things easy for John, as he was already struggling with the fact that Ben kept hiding things from him. Ben was actually sidelined throughout this episode because he couldn't be trusted. Talking of the old geezer, there's a flashback of him and Crowley working together in Central America in 1983, and it's clear that they've been working on a regime change for the CIA. Even back then, Crowley was questioning the point of all of this, and he argued that they should sell their services to the highest bidder. To start the penultimate episode of the season, the Shared Data Act is fittingly renamed to the Nora Evers American Protection Act. And I say fittingly renamed because this is what corrupt politicians across the globe love to do. They use labels to frame discussions in certain ways. You can't vote against American protection, can you? The most infamous example of this is the Patriot Act. You don't support it, you must not be a patriot. In fact, you must support the enemy. You must be a traitor. So you gotta make this act into law. People of this era love to think we are oh so smart, but uh, we are the most easily manipulated group of people that has ever existed. And the show is mirroring reality in this regard. Anyway, in two days, this act will be signed into law. So that's how much time John has to stop this. 
The problem is, he doesn't know who he can trust. He's having his doubts about his father, and even Valence seems to be back. John doesn't know what to think. We know that he processes information by running through different scenarios in his mind. We've seen it in action quite a few times, but this is now causing him trouble as he can't figure out which scenario is the most likely to be true. Is Valence alive? Why did he kill himself if he's dead? Was Ben behind all of this? And did he kill John's entire team? John has no idea what's true anymore, so he decides to run away from the hideout. He finds a computer store and gets in touch with the person on the message board. Simultaneously, we watch Kyle's boss move into Arda Analytics because Crowley's company Interverse has acquired it. Why? Because Arda Analytics is one of the three companies that will gain access to people's data after the Nora Evers American Protection Act is signed into the law. At his office, Kyle's boss is given a tablet showing John at the computer store. We go there to see that the person on the other side of the message board uses the alphanumerical code Valence and John are familiar with, and the first message says, Ben used us. John asks how, but he has to get out of there because he realizes he's being noticed. The second message, which John wasn't able to decipher on camera, reads, quote, Crowley is Ben. We need to meet. End quote. Haley tracks down John as well, but he acts like they are in danger. He puts her on a bus and gets out and goes on his own way. Where does he go? Well, do you remember the flash forward sequence from all the way back in episode 1? This is when that takes place. John talks with a priest about how his life got turned upside down in the last three weeks. He is interrupted by a phone call by his ex-wife Liv, who tells him she received a box from Valence, confusing John even more and making him think that his friend might really be alive. John pays a visit to Liv and retrieves the package, which is a piece of the Gilgamesh tablet we previously saw in Valence's office. John has no idea what this signifies. Meanwhile, Haley gets back to the hideout to learn that Edward has figured out what was inside the briefcase they stole in episode 6. It doesn't have any compromising information on Evers. Instead, the documents inside are a roadmap to Crowley's operation. Shell companies, bank accounts, routing numbers, social security numbers. Everyone who Crowley owns, including politicians, CEOs, journalists, and even two Supreme Court judges. With that much blackmail material, and with the data he'll gain from the Evers Act, Crowley will be the most powerful man on Earth. It's a shame they can't tell John about this, because he's not there. Kyle is tasked with apprehending John and bringing him to his boss, and he does. Kyle's boss plays an interesting game here, pretending to be a lowly pawn in all of this. So far it appeared as though he could be Crowley, but it doesn't look like that's the case. He tries to convince John that Ben is the one pulling the strings, he is behind Evers' assassination and thus the Evers Act. Ben used Valence to start Arda and made it a public company so that he could control it. So according to Kyle's boss, Ben is the mastermind, he's Crowley. John attacks him and finds an earpiece in his ear. The man talking on the earpiece appears to be Crowley, and he goes on about how Ben lied to John. He claims that Ben was the one who blew up the Aero Deli plane, and he says that Ben has been living three blocks away from John for the past 10 years. John is let go, they don't kill him because they want to create a conflict between John and Ben to resolve both issues at the same time. John considers killing Ben, he confronts his father, but before he can do anything rash, Edward accidentally breaks the Gilgamesh tablet and finds a memory card inside it. And it's a video of Valence from before his death. He says Crowley has infiltrated Arda and he has to kill himself in order to protect Ben and John, because Crowley wants John dead after the Edward job, and Valence can't do that. He chooses to sacrifice himself. With access to Valence's data, Crowley was able to contact John on the message board pretending to be Valence, but that illusion is now broken thanks to Valence's video. John finally takes a breather, he calms down, and everybody agrees to put this whole thing behind them to take Crowley down. I also have to mention the fact that while John was AWOL, Haley contacted Joe and gave her some of the information they found on Crowley. Jo took the info to her boss, who asked her to forget about it in exchange for whatever she would like. She asked for her old job back in the criminal division, and to head the task force that is after John. 
So far, nothing indicates that Joe is actually corrupt, which makes me think that her angle is to be as close to this case as possible, and going against her boss at this juncture won't do anybody any good. The season 1 finale delivers a masterclass on how to condition your viewers so that your twists become more effective. We begin with a woman being kidnapped from a parking lot and she appears to be Joe's partner because later on in the episode, Joe's daughter Chloe calls Joe to tell her that her other mom hasn't come home yet. She apparently went out shopping and the kidnapped woman was carrying groceries, so that tracks. Also, the kidnapped woman was talking to her significant other on the phone. She was complaining about the fact that her partner's career was being prioritized in their relationship while her own career was put on hold. And since Joe has been very busy, that also tracks. Which begs the question of who would want to kidnap Joe's wife, and why? That is easy to answer. Joe got her hands on the Crowley files, thanks to Haley. She went to her boss Morello with this information, and he wanted her to forget this in exchange for anything she'd like. She chose to become the head of the task force hunting down John. Morello works for Crowley and he must have made the big boss aware of these recent developments, prompting Crowley to kidnap Joe's partner in order to make sure Joe can be kept under control. What further solidifies that theory is the fact that shortly after the kidnappers cut a finger off their victim, Joe receives an email with a photo attached. None of this is looking good for her. Stepping back and taking a look at the bigger picture, we learn that the Evers Act has been signed into law by the president, allowing Crowley to parse all of that sweet government information as he owns Arda Analytics now, one of the three companies with access to that data. He starts off by eliminating three DC circuit judges, causing the second most powerful court in the country to be shut down. His scheme is firmly in motion, the country's institutions are in chaos and that benefits him greatly. We also find out that not only is he sick in the head, but he's also literally sick. Ben gives us some insight on Crowley's mindset. He apparently admires India's caste system and wants something similar for the US, with him at the top obviously. John puts together a plan to combat Crowley's takeover, but they can't be too direct as Crowley's influence is way too far reaching. They need to condition the public first to make sure they are ready for what's about to be revealed. Then it's a good thing that Ben and John have been feeding an internet personality named Morgan Shaw breadcrumbs throughout the season, growing Morgan's reach exponentially. He is watched by millions of people now, and he's been against the Evers Act from the very beginning. It turns out Ben leaked a theory about Edward possibly being alive, and this being tied to the Evers Act. Morgan popularized that theory, so the public is somewhat ready for Edward to be resurrected. Hashtag Ed is not dead is gaining a lot of traction. John contacts the rarest breed of our time, a trustworthy journalist named Deborah, and he arranges a meeting with her to discuss the Edward situation. He sends her a photo of him and Edward together, and she's interested, so they meet. She agrees to put Edward on the air to air out the dirty laundry he's in possession of. However, Joe finally catches up to John here and arrests him. He agrees to work with her if he can talk to his family, but Joe doesn't trust him. She thinks he's gonna use that opportunity to set something in motion. Crowley hears the whole interrogation thanks to Morello, and he wants to send a team to capture John's family. Morello gets right on that. He asks Rash to find Liv's address, but Joe has already been at Liv's house, so she gives him the address. It was Ben's job to safely evacuate John's ex-wife Liv and his son Sam, but they had to wait for Sam to get back to the house, allowing Crowley's goons to capture them. Liv and Ben are eventually brought to Crowley's hangar, where we finally get a clear look at Crowley's face. There he is. Meanwhile, Haley is tasked with driving Edward around until he goes on the air with Deborah. Morgan has been made aware of Edward's location, so he snaps a few photos of Edward to generate more hype regarding this conspiracy prior to the interview. Haley makes a stop before going into the studio and Edward wonders why. Well, she has to pick up John, who moments prior snatched Rash's keycard after pretending to give him his family's real address. John tries to make his escape and he gets close, but the place is put under lockdown after Rash realizes that his keycard is gone, meaning John can't get through the final few doors. 
That is when Joe comes to his rescue and gets him out, revealing that John and Joe have been working together this whole time. We'll have to address the why and the how later on. For now, Haley, John and Edward make it to the television studio where a live broadcast with Deborah will expose everything Crowley's been up to. Crowley isn't sitting around doing nothing, of course. He sends in a fake Department of Justice crew to the studio who pretend to have an injunction to stop the broadcast. This is all a distraction to sneak Kyle into the studio where he'll kill Edward to stop him from talking. By this point, John is wise to Crowley's ploys, so he realizes that the DOJ guys are imposters. Alongside Haley and a bunch of security guards, they nab Kyle as he steps out of the elevator. However, Crowley doesn't give up that easily, and while one of the guards looks through Kyle's bag, he is spotted by Crowley on Kyle's phone. Crowley, with all the data he has access to, looks into the guard's past and finds some unsavory transgressions from his past. Crowley blackmails the guard and he has to set Kyle free. He even gives Kyle his own gun. Crowley's next step is to contact Deborah's right-hand man and to scare him with something from his past too. The lad is spooked and he delays the start of the broadcast. Crowley asks for John, revealing to him that he's got Ben and Liv. It looks like Crowley's holding all the cards and John is gonna have to give up. That is because neither Crowley nor we know about John's Ace in the Hole, which is the title of this episode. You see, the woman who got kidnapped at the start of the episode wasn't Joe's wife. She was John's wife, and that kidnapping took place years ago. We saw that the kidnapped woman, the real Liv, was rescued by a badass operative, who is the woman pretending to be Liv. This was a brilliant long-term con by John to keep the real Liv safe because he didn't want her to go through the same experience again. So he chose to live a lie in order to fool the whole world for years, including his own team at DBA Advisors and more recently Ben and Crowley. Everybody thought that the fake Liv was the real one. And if someone were to, let's say, kidnap John's family in order to get to him, they would be in for a very rude awakening, as they would be dealing with a menace, and they would hold no leverage over John. Crowley learns that lesson as Fake Liv gets rid of her cuffs and takes out all of Crowley's goons. John says Crowley is Ben's and he can do whatever he'd like. Ben genuinely gets emotional because he thinks that's the nicest thing anyone has ever done for him. He's grateful and he takes out Crowley. You might have seen this twist coming if you paid attention when Liv and Ben were first brought to the hangar. If you looked closely, you could see that she was working on those cuffs from the get-go. Nonetheless, Kyle is still a problem back at the studio. He's got Edward in his sights. Luckily though, he's got his earpiece connecting him to Crowley, so he hears it when Crowley gets shot. Meaning that doing this job isn't gonna bring him any money, he doesn't have a boss anymore, so he aborts and escapes. All of this also answers the question of how and why Joe and John were working together. The email Joe received in the morning was from John, telling her and proving that Edward was alive. After that, they had a phone call and agreed to work together. John wanted to get arrested by Joe to bait Crowley into going after the fake Liv. They had no way of knowing where Crowley was. They couldn't go after him. So they tricked Crowley with Joe's fake interrogation of John. Crowley went after John's family and Joe gave Morello the address. In the end, Crowley brought the fake Liv and Ben to himself. So John didn't have to find him. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Back at the studio, Joe and Rash arrest the fake DOJ crew and it turns out Rash is a straight shooter because even though he caught Joe after John escaped, he decided to work with her after she explained everything to him. So Rash turns out to be a good guy. He's not corrupt like Morello. And upstairs, Edward goes on the air to share everything he knows. He says this is about trust. Trust in institutions, politicians and businesses. That trust is usually built into how we live our lives, making us incredibly vulnerable to bad faith actors. Crowley used that trust to almost capitulate an entire country. So to you, data might be just a bunch of boring ones and zeros, but in the wrong hands, it is the most scary thing imaginable. Even if you don't have anything to hide, that doesn't mean it's not gonna affect you. The ones who have secrets to hide can be manipulated and blackmailed by someone like Crowley, who wants to accumulate power. That's what intelligence agencies do, and the ones who wield that power are surely gonna affect you. 
That is part of this show's story, but it rings entirely true for our own situation in the real world. Doesn't matter where you live, how you vote, who you support. The leviathan that is the state and big business cannot be given carte blanche when it comes to your data. Ideally, they wouldn't be, but they manipulate people by using certain events to make them think that the laws they're passing and the actions they're taking are good. They make you think that certain measures are necessary. The Evers Act was an example of this from the show. They used a senator's assassination to induce fear, allowing them to pass this act in the name of safety. These labels and framing of discussions twist the truth to gain people's trust, and then people are stabbed in the back. Enough of that rant for now. Everybody finds out about this conspiracy thanks to the broadcast, and the Crowley documents lead to a myriad of arrests, with more to come. Joe lets John off the hook, and we learn that Haley gave Joe some info on her old boss Craig Payne. So in exchange for letting John off the hook for the bare metal job from episode 1, Joe takes down a corrupt real estate mogul. So Haley kills two birds with one stone. John and Haley grew closer in the finale. Earlier on, she admitted that she gave Joe some of the Crowley documents, and John was okay with that because he understood how she might have been scared by his paranoid behavior. So that was a nice moment they shared, and they walk out of the studio's building a happy couple. At this point, you think that's that, but you'd be wrong. We go back to the hangar where Ben finds an earpiece on Crowley, suggesting that he was either working with or for somebody else. Thank you for tuning in everybody. Be sure to leave your thoughts on Rabbit Hole in the comment section. Like the video if you've enjoyed this breakdown and subscribe for more movie reviews and TV show breakdowns. That is it for now. Take care and see you in the next video.